I am being safe. Dear Tim and Moby, what are national parks? Are they just bigger than regular parks? Curious, Adrian. Hey, Adrian. It's true that a lot of national parks are huge. The biggest, Wrangell St. Elias, can fit the entire state of Massachusetts inside it, with room to spare for Delaware and Rhode Island. But size alone isn't what defines them. A national park is a specific type of protected area. That's a piece of land with special laws against development. Like, you couldn't just build a new home or business there. It's public land, meaning it belongs to all of us. So our representatives in government decide how best to use it on everyone's behalf. National parks are chosen based on the things you can see and do there. Some have crazy rock formations, like the hoodoos of Bryce Canyon. Arches Park has thousands of stone gateways formed by millions of years of erosion, and Carlsbad Caverns is filled with bizarre mineral formations. Trekking through its caves is like taking a voyage to an alien planet. Other parks support unusual ecosystems with all sorts of rare wildlife, like this blind shrimp that lives only in the underground pools of Mammoth Cave, or the West Indian manatees that take refuge in Biscayne Bay, and this cute little dude, the Pacific Fisher. All of those animals were on the brink of extinction when a species is completely killed off. Thanks to places like Olympic National Park, they're making a comeback. Endangered species, those at risk of disappearing, are released onto parkland, the hope is that they'll breed and repopulate the area. Dozens of species have rebounded under the protection of our parks. Well, protection from us, uh, humans. Centuries ago, most of America was just like this, pristine wilderness. All you could see for miles and miles was unspoiled terrain. The new country seemed to have an endless supply of resources and space. So for much of our early history, Americans were encouraged to strike out into the wilderness and settle it. Yeah, millions of American Indians had already settled it to their own liking. But in the space of a century, westward expansion changed the face of their land. Towns popped up and blossomed into cities. Transportation networks were built to link them all together. And wave after wave of settlers pushed the frontier farther west. As the country grew, so did the need for resources like food and energy. More and more land was devoted to logging, mining, manufacturing, and farming. By the late 1800s, the country stretched from sea to sea. Suddenly, America's resources didn't seem quite so limitless anymore. Forests could be wiped out, streams polluted, animals hunted to extinction. What's more, natural wonders could be ruined. Americans had already seen that happen to Niagara Falls earlier in the century. The land around the falls had been sold in pieces to private developers. So, while the Canadian side remained pristine, the U.S. side was marred by souvenir shops, litter, and logging. Nobody wanted the same fate to befall the wonders of the West. Most Western land was already owned by the federal government. So, in 1872... Congress created our first national park in the Rockies. Yellowstone covers thousands of square miles spread across three states. Millions of people visit the park every year to camp, hike, and sightsee. Many come to see Old Faithful, the world's most famous geyser. Today, it seems only natural that we would protect this place, but in the 19th century, it was still a radical concept. Declaring a big piece of land off-limits was disruptive. It meant kicking out people who had already staked claims and canceling big projects planned by state governments. These local interests actively worked against Yellowstone's protections. Lumber and mining companies ignored restrictions. Poachers hunted illegally without fear of punishment. And legislators tried to strip Yellowstone of its protected status. 
parks created afterward met similar resistance, and park supporters were split on how to protect them. On one side, preservationists believed that protected lands should remain as wild and undeveloped as possible. John Muir was the face of this movement. He had spent years exploring the Yosemite region in California. His best-selling books described the spiritual value of simply being in nature. They were a big part of why Yosemite was declared a national park. On the other side, conservationists thought protected areas should be lightly developed to encourage tourism. Logging, mining, and such would be allowed, but only with strict regulations. Theodore Roosevelt was an early champion of these ideas. As president, Roosevelt set an agenda for land use that lasts to this day. He created five national parks, as well as hundreds of national forests and game preserves. Smaller sites were also set aside for their natural beauty or their significance to history and science. In all, Roosevelt put an area larger than Texas under federal protection. The resources in these places could be developed, but the land would remain public. That way, the government could impose strict rules for its use. A decade later, Congress created the National Park Service. Its army of rangers and park police kept protected areas clean and enforced the rules. Today, there are 59 national parks and thousands of protected areas. More than a quarter of all U.S. land falls under some kind of federal protection. But the argument over how to use it is far from settled. Dozens of our protected areas sit on top of fossil fuel reserves. Pressure is on to let energy companies extract those resources. That could mean a sell-off of federal lands to private businesses, or relaxing laws put in place to prevent pollution. Well, it's up to each generation to strike a responsible balance. We're lucky these places were managed so well for us to enjoy. We ought to do all we can to pass them on to future generations. I couldn't have said it better myself.